All right, because it's uh, been so busy for the WPT crew because of the campaign season, they're not here tonight again, so I get to do the informal presentation. Uh, delighted to have Professor Stan Temple come back to Wednesday night at the lab. He was very gracious in being willing to give this talk on just a few weeks' notice. There was a story in the New York Times uh, about three weeks ago on this issue of cats, free-ranging cats and their impacts on wildlife, particularly native birds. Um, Stan is Professor Emeritus of the Forest and Wildlife Ecology. He's with the Elder Leopold Foundation. Uh, can you tell me where you were born? Cleveland, Ohio. Go tribe. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, and you're here? <laughs> My condolences. So we can watch the game. <laughs> wow, I didn't know. I didn't remember. And uh, where'd you go to high school? In Cleveland. And where'd you go to college? Cornell. And is that where you got your PhD also? All three degrees. All three degrees. And how long have you been in Madison? Oh boy. <laughs> Do the math. Uh, almost oh, 40 years. No, no, no. 40 years. 40 years. Wow, that's only. Uh, never mind. <laughs> How many years has it been since the Cubs won? One day. They won yesterday. <laughs> so, um, I think you're going to have some pretty interesting background on this, on this book. It's, I hope you'll tell the stories a little bit about what you just told me as we were sitting here about how people are responding to the book and some of the pressures on people. Uh, but please join me in welcoming Stan Temple back to Wednesday Night Delight. And you have consistently invited me back to speak about controversial wildlife issues. I do. Is that all right? Oh, it's fine. Is there um, any non-controversial and, and this is one that I stumbled into quite innocently now almost 30 years ago when my students and I did some of the pioneering work looking at the ecological impacts of free-ranging cats on wildlife in Wisconsin. And we were interested in the age-old biological conflict that everyone's familiar with, that cats are predators on birds. And at the time, um, we were concerned about declining populations of grassland birds in Wisconsin, and in our studies of those birds, discovered that a major source of mortality uh, were free-ranging cats associated with Wisconsin farms. What I did not know at the time was that I was about to enter a big social conflict that to some extent pitted what I'll call cat people against bird people. And those are, of course, not mutually exclusive categories, but the cat people of the world uh, have a primary interest in the welfare of individual animals, focused in their case primarily on cats. They're worried about human beings doing ethically appropriate things to other individual animals. They view death caused by human beings as a, a, a moral affront. On the other hand, bird people are far more interested in species and populations. They are not quite as concerned about the death of individuals as they are about the declines of species or, or in the worst case, the extinction of species. They tend as you might imagine, to be groups that have very different worldviews when it comes to the biological conflict between cats and birds. But just so everyone knows where I'm coming from on this subject, this is not a primary focus of my research at all. What I've spent my career on was basically studying threatened and endangered species. And the cats were essentially a, a side issue. Uh, we did this work on free-ranging rural cats in, in rural Wisconsin and um, was almost immediately accused of basically doing this work because I was a cat hater and that we were doing this work just to justify persecuting cats. And let me assure you, I do not hate cats. I have pet indoor cats of my own and am in no way motivated by causing harm to uh, cats. 
as a researcher, I've only sought to uh, clarify the issue and perhaps find solutions. So let's look first at the biological conflict. Domestic cats are, like dogs and other farm animals, domesticated species that human beings have literally brought around the world with them. They are now <coughs> nearly cosmopolitan and that they're found almost everywhere in the world. However, because they are domesticated species, they are nowhere native. Everywhere that they occur, they are non-native, they're exotic, and to some extent, when they are allowed to free range or become feral, they become invasive species that can invade natural communities and do great harm. The cat problem in particular is that the numbers of cats have literally exploded during the 20th century. We don't have, of course, accurate historical data, but what we know from the 20th century is that there's been a, just a huge, almost exponential increase in the numbers of, of cats around the world. And they have caused a lot of conservation uh, problems. Most alarmingly, they have been a major agent of extinction. They have caused many extinctions of other animals, <coughs> especially on, on islands around the world. They've been involved in 14% of 238 extinctions of mammals, birds, and reptiles on islands around the world. And some of you who read the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences may know that just a couple of weeks ago, there was a major review paper looking at the impact that feral introduced mammals had on species around the world. And the conclusion was that free-ranging and feral cats were the number one mammalian predator that threatens other species, have caused extinctions, and of course continue to cause species to become threatened today. They are rivaled by rats, and perhaps not surprisingly, in many of the places, especially on islands where you find cats, they were introduced specifically to take care of the rats that we introduced. The story of cats and birds and extinction sort of are typified by the story of Stevens Island. Stevens Island is a small little island between the North and South Islands of New Zealand. And it was uninhabited until they constructed a lighthouse out there at the end of the 19th century. And the first lighthouse keeper to go out to this remote rock uh, brought along his pet cat and allowed the pet cat to range freely on the island. And in no time at all, the cat started to bring in what animals were living on the island, including this very unusual little bird that the lighthouse keeper had never seen on New Zealand and being something of a bird watcher, he'd never even seen a bird like this. It was almost flightless, tiny little bird called the Stevens Island Wren. His cat killed a number of them. He preserved some of those, brought them back to ornithologists after his tour of duty at the lighthouse was over, and they were amazed. It was at the time a new species, a new genus, and a new family of birds. They went back to the island to learn more about this amazing bird and couldn't find a single one. One cat, a little over one year, one unique species was, was gone. New Zealand has had a history of just nightmares of introduced mammals wreaking havoc with its indigenous uh, fauna. And they have recently been in the news for the very aggressive stance that they have now taken against these introduced mammals. Uh, they have vowed uh, to basically eliminate every one of the major mammalian predators on their native uh, fauna uh, before the end of the century, including free-ranging cats. So could they do that? Could they actually succeed in getting rid of these species on places as large as, as New Zealand? Uh, probably it will be a monumental task, but we do have some hopeful signs that on smaller islands, we have been successful at getting rid of mammalian predators like cats. Marion Island, an island of great importance as a seabird nesting colony south of, uh, of South Africa, uh, has had uh, an up and down history of, of cats. Cats were introduced in 1949 to try to control the rat population that was running rampant on the island. 25 years later, uh, 
there were over 12,000 of them, over 100 cats per, per square mile. And they were killing approximately half a million seabirds a year, since that was literally all that was there to eat, except for the rats that cats really didn't have much impact on. They drove one species to extinction and threatened the others. In this case, they were able to eliminate the cats, in this case using a biological control, introducing several feline diseases to which these cats had, had no um, resistance. So there are examples of getting rid of, of animals like cats on, on islands, at least, around the world. We have our own problems with, with cats on islands. In the Hawaiian Islands, cats are a major threat um, to birds there. A recent listing of two Hawaiian endemic bird species as, as endangered species, uh, with predation by cats being a fairly important cause of their threatened status. So most of the horror stories about cats and birds actually come from island situations. Obviously, a somewhat different ecological situation on continents. So the question is, how do free-ranging and feral cats affect populations of wildlife on continents? And I should say, just so everybody's clear of what I mean, feral cats are cats that have gone completely wild that are completely independent of human beings. They do exist in places like Hawaii and New Zealand where there are very mild climates. Places like Wisconsin, we have no truly feral cats. They are all dependent in some way on human beings for food and shelter. Free-ranging cats is a sort of a broader term of cats that have access to the out of, out of doors. They are uh, cats often that are owned pets cats that are maintained in the out of doors uh, deliberately by, by people. To some extent, they make up the pool of feline predators that we're going to talk about. I will use the term free-ranging cats, though, to encompass them all. So what we've learned, actually, in the decades since we did our studies here in Wisconsin, is that in many continental ecosystems, free-ranging and feral <coughs> cats are one of the most important mid-sized mammalian predators in the ecological community. They have to some extent taken on a, an outsized significance uh, in terms of their, their predation. And they have affected, as you saw, reptiles, birds, and, and small mammals. Beside their predation on species like that, they also, because of their numbers and because of their adaptability, they also outcompete native predators, so that in many areas you can clearly demonstrate a negative correlation between the number of free-ranging cats on the landscape and the number of native predators. And to make matters worse, they are also responsible for transmitting diseases that are in some cases unique to cats to other native wildlife species um, and to human beings. So, they are generally bad news for biodiversity. They're generally bad news for uh, the native uh, fauna. So when I said that we are experiencing something of an explosion of cat numbers, the numbers really are quite alarming. The most reliable numbers that we can sort of hang a hat on come from the pet food industry because obviously they have a bottom line interest in how many cat, pet cats are out there being fed, and they come up with periodic estimates of how many cats are out there consuming their, their products. And as you can see, by the last 40 odd years, um, we have more than tripled the number of fed pet cats uh, in the US. The US Census tells us that somewhere from 37 to 47 percent of households in the US have pet cats. Um, in rural areas, it tends to be a higher percentage the total cat population is broadly estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 148 to 188 million cats and growing. And about 117 million are estimated to be either free ranging or feral, which if you do the math means that a lot of pet cats are outdoor cats. They are allowed to go outside and free range and that thus have access uh, to, to wildlife. 
when you look at that growth, you know, it's pretty alarming and it shows no sign of, of slowing down, which is why this conflict has really come to such a head. Um, it's because of the, the magnitude of the threat, the geographic extent, and the damage that these free-ranging and feral cats are doing to wildlife. Well, as I said, I kind of got into this innocently uh, back when I had more hair and uh, <laughs> when I was a young professor here. And uh, the study that we did was funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. At the time, they were spending a lot of money trying to encourage farmers in Wisconsin to create wildlife habitat on the farm. They were giving lots of subsidies and incentives away. The Conservation Reserve Program that many of you probably heard of was one of the larger programs. When we told them that you are often creating very attractive habitat for grassland birds very close to farmsteads in Wisconsin, and those farmsteads are generally crawling with what are affectionately known as barn cats, that you are almost luring these birds to come in and nest in places where they're going to be subjected to excess mortality. We call it an ecological trap, where an animal is attracted to a place where it's not likely to do well. We were funded to do the work immediately before we had even collected any data we were targeted as the enemy. And the hate mail started. There were letters to the president of the UW, letters to the governor protesting that their tax dollars were being used to pay the salary of this pseudo-scientist who's clearly a cat hater and is just out to justify uh, persecuting cats. So what did we find? Well, we found doing very standard sort of survey techniques that there were at least 1.4 million free-ranging cats in rural Wisconsin. We didn't pay any attention to the suburbs and urban areas. We were interested in the places where cats and wildlife have the greatest contact. We found that in some townships, we had densities of cats like they had on Marion Island, over 100 cats per square mile, where there was a high density of rural homes and, and farms. And the interesting thing is that for many of those townships, that density of cats exceeds the combined density of all of our native mid-sized predators combined. Add up all the foxes and raccoons and possums and skunks and weasels, there are more cats out there. So they really are the principal predator on the rural Wisconsin landscape. And, as I said, these are human commensals. They are not true ferals. They are all have home ranges that are centered on human dwellings where they get shelter, food, and, and other sustenance. Well, we were not just interested in finding out how many cats were out there. Of course, we studied them intensely by radio tagging them, following them around, analyzing far more cat feces than I tend to remember, uh, getting cats that we had trapped to regurgitate their stomach contents after we gave them an emetic to find out exactly what they were eating and how many animals they were killing. And our sample revealed that these rural cats in Wisconsin were killing at least 5.6 birds per cat per year. And we found no difference between the pets that were kept in rural homes and the barn cats that were not really considered pets. Basically, all of them, whether they were fed or not, uh, killed, killed wildlife. So when these numbers started to um, sort of be broadcast, um, people were pretty shocked that we're talking about millions of birds in Wisconsin alone being killed uh, by cats. However, although we were sort of at the vanguard of these studies, uh, it basically precipitated a wave of studies looking at free-ranging cats in other ecosystems around the country. And they all came up with similarly alarming densities of cats and the number of animals that were being uh, killed. And in all cases, as we report our results in Wisconsin, we recognize that our estimates are probably minimum estimates, that we couldn't possibly have accounted for all of them. And we were able by working with some cat owners who had free-ranging cats 
to verify other studies that have previously shown that if you think the, you have an outdoor cat, which I hope you don't, but if you do and your cat deposits prey in the house, um, that is probably less than a third of what it's actually killing. So the impact of free-ranging cats in Wisconsin and elsewhere is really significant. In Wisconsin alone, it's at least 7.8 million uh, birds per, per year. And because, if you recall, we got into this because we were censusing bird populations in rural Wisconsin, we knew what that amounted to in terms of bird populations and communities. And it's staggering that somewhere in the neighborhood of nine or 10 percent of the birds that live within the hunting range of these cats that are centered on rural homes and farms are killed by cats each year. And many of them are ground-dwelling birds like our grassland birds that are in pretty deep trouble. The numbers from elsewhere are, are similarly alarming. As I said, there are now dozens and dozens of these studies all over. Um, and basically, when you start to think at a national level, the numbers really do start to, uh, to build up. Even if each of the estimated free-ranging and feral cats in the U.S. kill just one bird a year, you're talking about hundreds of millions of birds being killed. And those numbers started to become possible to really estimate more precisely after all of these regional studies had been done two years ago. Uh, a study, a meta-population, a meta-analysis was uh, published that took data from all of these studies and tried to come up with a more precise estimate of what the national toll was. This is when it really hit the fan. This was published in Nature, and the uh, estimate um, was, was truly quite uh, alarming that they estimated that free-ranging domestic cats kill somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half to three and a half billion birds a year um, in the U.S. and many more small mammals. And the point of their paper was not just to come up with an estimate for the national toll, but also to put it into perspective of the other human-generated sources of mortality for birds. And this graph shows you that. Um, Cats being in the U.S., and there was parallel data from Canada, but in both the U.S. <coughs> and Canada, cats were the largest single human-related source of mortality, beating out collisions with, with buildings and windows and automobiles and power lines and communication towers, all of these other things that we often think of as being terribly catastrophic in terms of mortality is dwarfed by the number that are killed uh, by birds. So this was really shocking. Those numbers were much greater than anyone had, had guessed. Um, and the analysis was, well, it was a good enough analysis to be published in Nature. Stan, do you happen to know why there's no data for the chemi uh, chemicals from the United States, but there's from Canada? If you go all the way over there, um, that's a good question, and it's probably because those um, are not tracked by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They are tracked by the EPA, and the EPA does not attempt to estimate mortality except on a field basis, so they don't do it at a state or regional level. They do it on a field-by-field -field, uh, basis. Would you expect Canada to be a reasonable proxy for the U.S.? Probably although we have more agricultural land. For the same reason, for example, that you know a lot of these things are greater in the U.S. We've got greater <laughs> land area, and a lot of these activities, human activities, take place much more often in the U.S. People who are sort of in denial about the magnitude of the problem of cat predation will often offer some now fairly time-worn uh, excuses for why we shouldn't be worried about it. Um, Well-fed cats don't kill wildlife. That is totally a myth. Uh, no matter how fat your cat is, if they have access to prey, they will kill. Cats with bells can't kill wildlife. There's 
absolutely nothing in the evolutionary history of any potential prey species that says a tinkling little bell means you're about to be pounced on by a predator. It simply does not work at all, and we verified that actually with our radio telemetry studies. Captured animals that escape, get away, scot free, absolutely false. If you deal with the wildlife rehabilitators, they'll tell you that any animal that has been severely bitten by a cat is essentially doomed uh, to die, usually eventually by an infection. And cat predation being equivalent to, to native predators, cats are totally unlike native predators, not the least of which is because they're human commensals. We call them subsidized predators because they're getting shelter and food supplements from human beings, which means that they get decoupled from their prey. And it means that you know, a well-fed cat, for example, will continue to hunt even though prey may be so scarce in the area that any native predator would essentially move out of the area and, and look somewhere else. So predation by cats is the biggest issue, but it's not the only issue. We know that free-ranging and feral cats are also important vectors for to spreading disease to native wildlife species, and I might add to, uh, to human beings as well. A number of the diseases that we routinely vaccinate our pet cats against, knowing full well that especially if they're an outdoor cat, they're gonna get one of these diseases if you don't vaccinate them and they will die. Well, native feline predators like the Florida panther or bobcats here in Wisconsin um, don't get vaccinated against these diseases. So when they come in contact with free-ranging and feral cats, uh, they're very vulnerable. It's one of the major problems for the endangered Florida panther. Usually the disease is probably acquired because the panther has killed a feral cat in Florida. The same is probably true of bobcats in Wisconsin. A number of years ago, I had a female bobcat with a den on my property, and being a curious wildlife biologist, I was not going to leave her motherhood alone and sort of kept track of what was happening. And about the time that her three kittens were starting to come out of the den, they all fell sick and died. We brought them out to the National Wildlife Health Center here, and sure enough, they died of, of feline distemper and the only place they could have gotten feline distemper in northwestern Dane County was from free-ranging cats. Well, transmission of diseases to native felines is one thing, but cats are also the definitive host for a really nasty disease that not only affects the diversity of wildlife species, but it also affects people. Toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is a uniquely cat generated disease in that cats, domestic cats, are the definitive host for this species. Secondary, intermediate hosts can be sickened and, and killed by being infected with the oocysts that are shed um, in cat feces. And where you have high concentrations of feral and free-ranging cats shedding oocysts, a lot of wildlife species and human beings come into contact around the country large percentages, alarming percentages, we're talking sometimes a third to a half of the human population, shows antibodies to toxoplasma, which means they've been exposed. And the only way they could be exposed is through cat feces. So a number of, uh, of species get severely affected, a species that I worked on for a number of years, the Hawaiian crow, the rarest bird actually in the US, uh, turns out that it is affected by toxoplasmosis. Sea otters on the west coast, especially in California, are affected. You might say, how in the world is a sea otter affected by something that's transmitted by cat feces? Well, it turns out there are so many cats in California, so much kitty litter and feces that gets essentially dumped down the storm sewers or down the drain, the oocyst persists through the treatment, it washes out into the ocean where it's picked up by filter feeding animals that are the principal prey for sea otters. So when they feed on abalone and clams and so forth, they get exposed and again, uh, suffer mortality. And it is really nasty for people too. Most of you probably are aware that pregnant women are, are strongly advised not to have contact with any cat that is not known to them 
to be an indoor cat that they know the history of for fear of the transmission of toxoplasmosis that has serious consequences for a fetus. So the story builds that cats in the out of doors are a serious problem. And although it's recognized as a significant and now very well documented problem, um, it's created a, something of a dilemma for society because of that social divide that I started the talk with. It's rather remarkable that although uh, during the early 20th century we dealt rather effectively with the problem of feral and free-ranging dogs by basically requiring people to keep their dogs confined uh, with leash laws, uh, somehow we have not done that with cats, where we clearly accept that it's uh, unacceptable to allow your dog to free range or have packs of feral dogs running around because of what they do to native wildlife, because of diseases like rabies that they can transmit. Uh, for some reason, controlling cat populations has been much more controversial. And a lot of the controversy stems over the practice of humane euthanasia to deal with unwanted cats. Uh, it has been the standard prescription and it has led, not surprisingly, from the perspective of the cat people that this was a completely unacceptable practice to be opposed. And one of the consequences of that over perhaps the last 30 or 40 years has been the feral cat colony phenomenon where people who, are, um, who like cats and who do not want to see these feral and free-ranging cats rounded up and euthanized in a shelter if they can't be adopted, they will essentially spend a lot of time and money feeding them, providing them with shelter, um, and building up these huge colonies of, of cats that are essentially maintained by caretakers. Unfortunately, Many of the places that they chose to establish these feral cat colonies were, in fact, protected natural areas. They were national parks and state parks and other places where wildlife was supposed to thrive, and yet they were maintaining these very high numbers of, of cats there. So you ended up with, uh, pro with, with basically prohibitions on establishing these colonies on some of our um, national protected areas. The legal status of cats is much murkier, you might say, in some respects than dogs. Uh, clearly, pet cats are considered personal property and they are the responsibility of their owner. So whatever damage that cat does is essentially the responsibility of the owner. And in most communities, free-ranging feral cats can be trapped. If they're owned, if they can be identified, they get returned often with a fine to the owner, but in many cases uh, they are, are euthanized. A lot of areas have the equivalent of leash laws for cats that require cats to be neutered and to be in some way uh, confined. And again, if that is not basically adhered to, the cats are often uh, rounded up and, and euthanized. Many cats, or many states, have officially sort of taken the ecological perspective that these are invasive exotic species. And there's no reason that we should be treating feral cats any differently than we do other invasive exotic species. And that is to officially list them as unprotected animals, which means essentially that the state usually has no particular interest in how individuals deal with these animals as long as they don't break any other laws in the process. So in the same way that you don't need a state permit to trap a mouse or a rat in your house or take care of the pigeons in your barn, in those states that have cats listed as unprotected animals, you can essentially deal with unwanted cats without having any sort of legal interference as long as you don't break any other laws such as anti-cruelty laws or, or gun laws and so forth. But honestly, the effective management of cats has, has been elusive. We simply have not been able to come up with an effective way of slowing down that growth in feral and free-ranging cat populations. 
There's been, obviously, because of the interest of, of the cat people, there's a lot of interest in finding non-lethal control strategies that would sort of satisfy their desire to deal with the problem without having to kill cats. And although a number of approaches have been tried, none of them have been effective, and honestly, neither have the lethal approaches been that effective. Uh, they simply haven't been up to the, the task of countering the growth in the cat population. Some of these approaches can work on very small areas, on city blocks, on college campuses, on schoolyards, and so forth. And they'll work for a short period of time, but they simply don't work over large areas and over long periods of time. They simply just don't work. There is and has been for, oh boy, about seven or eight years now, $25 million out there waiting, the Mickelson Prize. The Mickelson Prize, $25 million to somebody who can come up with the silver bullet, the non-lethal approach to dealing with unwanted, uh, often invasive species, including cats, not just exclusively cats, but also burrows and horses on western rangeland and a whole host of other species that have become sort of the uh, poster animals for no kill, dealing with the problem without killing animals. The Mickelson Prize is out there, no one's claimed it. They simply haven't been able to come up with a non-lethal approach that actually works. That hasn't stopped uh, some from advocating for a program called Trap, Treat, Neuter, and Return, TNR. This is a fairly recent phenomenon that comes out of the no-kill movement. And their idea here is that they will take volunteers who will go out and trap cats. They will take them to veterinarians who will usually pro bono or for a very low cost, will neuter them, vaccinate them against all their diseases and parasites, and they are then returned right back to the place where they were trapped. The logic, the biological logic behind this is neutering them. If they can do this to a large enough portion of the population, the population will inevitably decline. Unfortunately, the math doesn't work. You need to trap and neuter a very large proportion of a cat population to make this work. And having spent many, many hours trying to trap cats, they are not easy to trap. Um, so a huge amount of effort would have to go into it, and uh, it simply cannot be done on a scale that matches the, uh, the problem. So TNR is vigorously promoted by cat people. It is vigorously opposed by the bird people. And obviously, the opposition from the bird people comes from the fact that the cats are returned, that they go right back where they came from, where they can continue uh, to do harm to wildlife. So I said that population models can basically demonstrate this. You don't need to spend a lot of time and effort going out and, and trying this. You can simply do pop, simple population modeling to see how many cats would you have to trap and neuter for this to possibly work. And based on our data from radio collared cats here at Wisconsin, we know what their mortality <laughs> rates are, we know what their fecundity is like, how many offspring they're producing. So we can run the model for rural cats in Wisconsin for which we have a lot of data. So we start off the model with 80 female kittens. And we know from our study that about 18% of them will live to reproductive age. A lot of early mortality because of those cat diseases that they aren't vaccinated against. Once they reach adulthood, they survive at a rate of 38% each year. And each year, each female produces a little over four living kittens um, a year. And what that means, if you run that out over time, is that over 10 years, a rural cat population in Wisconsin will double. Pretty much what we have seen. So imagine that you were going to trap 10% of these free-ranging sort of non-pet cat populations 
in rural Wisconsin, the barn cats, if you will. Um, so you could trap 10% of them, which would be quite an effort to do on any sort of large scale. Imagine trying to catch 10% of the barn cats, even in a county, and you euthanized them. Well, what you have, the same thing with a lower survival rate, both uh, initially and annually. Um, and what you see is that the cat population still increases at 13% over 10 years. So imagine you do the TNR um, type of approach, again, with a 10% trapping success. In this case, you end up with essentially two adult populations, the ones that you haven't trapped and neutered and the ones that you have neutered. So the model becomes a little bit more complicated, but still what it shows is that over 10 years, the population continues uh, to grow. And indeed, it's not until you can trap 20% or more of the cat population that you can actually generate a decline. And in this case, the graphs that my software produces are a little misleading, but this over a 10 year, over a 20 year period is only a 1% reduction in the cat population. So even an unrealistically high success rate at trapping and, and neutering produces a very small effect on the cat population. So you ask, could it ever work? A number of other population biologists have looked at it and said, you know, for it to really work at any kind of regional scale with the numbers of cats that we're dealing with, you would probably have to trap and neuter in excess of 70% of the cat population in order to eliminate the cat population over a period <coughs> of time. And that's simply impossible to imagine doing at the spatial scale at which the problem um, exists. Well, all of this, of course, feeds a controversy uh, that pits the cat people and the bird people together. And many of you will remember that it reached a, a sort of fever pitch in Wisconsin back in 2005 when a firefighter from La Crosse submitted a question to our annual Conservation Congress. The Conservation Congress is this annual event in which the Department of Natural Resource invites the public to come and comment on things that the DNR is doing or suggest things that the DNR should be doing but aren't doing. So he asked the question, why isn't Wisconsin listing <coughs> feral and free-ranging cats as unprotected animals, like all of the surrounding states in the Midwest? It was a pretty simple, simple question to get the DNR's response. Well, it really seemed at the time uh, to be, he certainly had no idea that he was going to touch off a uh, firestorm, but the coverage of that Conservation Congress came out under the headline, Wisconsin to open a hunting season on cats, <laughs> which was absolutely not the case at all. In fact, the question was saying, why does the DNR just disavow itself of any responsibility for cats and let people take care of the, of the problem? Um, well, in any event, a media circus erupted. Some of you will remember it. We were internationally uh, sort of targeted as, look what's happening, There's crazy people in Wisconsin. The misinformation was, was horrible. The uh, uh, Society for Environmental Journalism, every year they give sort of um, recognition to what they think is one of the worst reporting of an environmental issue. And that year, the reporting on the cat story from Wisconsin took top prize. It was horribly handled by, by the media. I was vilified because the uh, fireman from La Crosse had basically referenced our research um, in justifying why Wisconsin should consider this. So cat people, the animal welfare, animal rights groups really targeted uh, Wisconsin because of the media frenzy, policymakers basically just said, we, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with this. Uh, and the consequence of that was that 
the issue basically died with no follow-up discussion, without any sort of rational debate over whether this was a good idea or, or not. And it was somewhat ironic that while all of this was going on, there was actually a court case underway that challenged a fellow up in northern Wisconsin who had killed some feral cats on his property. And the local district attorney went after him very aggressively and after months of, of prosecuting, trying to prosecute this guy, finally gave up and said, although what I think you've done is horrible, I cannot find a single thing in the statutes of Wisconsin to prosecute you with. It wasn't that cruel. Stop a good hmm? <laughs> <laughs> in any event, this really brought hellfire and brimstone down on me. Uh, my email and phone were ringing constantly, and as some of you probably know, some people went way, way overboard. The death threats, including this one, that uh, the woman who made this death threat called me at home at midnight. I hung up on her, and she turned around and called my university phone and left a long, rambling message that was waiting for me the next morning. Um, it sure sounded pretty much like a death threat to me. I called the university police, and they agreed. Uh, they said, you just don't worry about it. This was a threat against a university employee. We'll take over from here. She's now a convicted felon. And it convinced me more than ever <laughs> that I get along better with animals than, than people. <laughs> but in all of this, because I have been often at the center of the controversies because of our early work, I've had to come up with a position. And I have taken a pretty firm position that anything that I would endorse has to meet a three-way test. As a biologist, I have to know that it's actually going to work, that it's biologically, demographically possible to control cat numbers using this approach. It has to avoid ecological harm. It can't involve leaving cats out there in the environment to kill wildlife. And it has to be obviously be socially acceptable to most people. And I have supported a couple of approaches. One that I helped formulate um, is the American Bird Conservancy's Cats Indoors program. Keep your cat indoors for the sake of your cat and wildlife. Easily justified. And we know from the studies of cat predation around the country that if people who love and care for their pet cat would simply keep them indoors, anywhere from a third to a half of the problem simply goes away. It's as simple as keeping your cat indoors to make a major significant reduction in the mortality. The other approach that I have sort of tepidly endorsed would be a trap, treat, neuter, and confine. Great, if it makes you feel better to rescue these cats um, and treat them of their diseases and make sure that they live long, happy lives, um, just don't do the last bit. Don't return them put them somewhere where you can confine them in a cat enclosure so that they don't have access to wildlife. It's relatively easy to do. There are lots of ways of building cat-proof enclosures, <coughs> and uh, if you would do this, you would essentially avoid the problem of cat predation and satisfy the, the no-kill uh, criteria. So moving forward and thinking about you know, how, how do we get this thing off zero, one is just simply acknowledging the problem, which a lot of people simply are in denial about. They simply don't recognize that the problem exists or they're in denial about it. So some of it is, is essentially education. Understanding the scale of the problem the publications that are coming out now that are showing these staggering numbers uh, illustrate, I think, cl more clearly than I could illustrate just from studies in rural Wisconsin, that this is a really big problem, both in terms of the numbers of animals that are being killed and in terms of the spatial scale over which it's happening. And of course, as we uh, well know from most controversies in society today, it's going to turn essentially into a problem of vilifying messengers, uh, giving death threats and ugly emails to people uh, who are viewed as the opposition. 
And there's a fairly healthy dose of science denial in this particular controversy of basically discrediting all the scientists who have done research on, on free-ranging cats. And finally, there's this paradox of what is really compassionate uh, to do and humane to do in our treatment of animals. The idea that you cannot euthanize an animal, that somehow that is unacceptable, really is sometimes very difficult to reconcile with what is compassionate and humane to do in the face of a problem like cat overpopulation. So in conclusion, far too many feral and free-ranging cats in the U.S. and the problem is only getting worse. There's no question now that these cats are having very harmful impacts on wildlife, that these cats can spread diseases also to, to human beings, that these cats that are feral and free-ranging, they lead short and often dismal lives that are cut short by disease and accidents and, and indeed predation on the cats themselves. Clearly, if you have a pet cat that you love and care for, neuter it and, and keep it in, indoors. And the root of the problem is really these choices that people make, the choices that people make about allowing pet cats to reproduce um, at an unacceptable rate, the problem of people deciding to let their pet cats be free ranging. All of these need to be addressed using perhaps my three-way three -way test. And finally, you can basically say that fewer free-ranging and feral cats would be better for cats, better for wildlife, and better for people. And Tom asked me to comment on the book that prompted him to ask me uh, to give this talk tonight. It is out now. Uh, Peter Mara, who's the author of that study in Nature, uh, the meta-analysis, um, it's a very balanced book talking about well, just what I did tonight, talking about the subject of this conflict over cats and, and, and wildlife. So to show you how the reaction to this book has played out, as many of you know, Amazon.com will list a book for sale in advance of it actually being for sale and, and available. This book, weeks before it was available for people to read, but was available for advance order on Amazon, attracted hundreds of reviews that all gave it the lowest review possible <laughs> and had just horrible things to say about the book that they had never read. Once the book came out, Princeton University Press, the publisher, and the president of Princeton University were flooded with emails and phone calls demanding that the book be retracted Book banning is alive and well in the 21st century. So even attempts like this to present a very even-handed analysis of the extent of the problem often get vilified. And I don't know whether you've ever shown anything like this at Wednesday Night at the Lab, but I thought I would just share with you without any comment uh, a recent email that I received that gives you a little bit of the flavor of what anyone who happens to be more on the bird people side than the cat people side um, often get subjected to. So thank you very much. Not for that, but. <laughs> right. So I know very little about wildlife biology, and if I heard you correctly uh, in the beginning of the talk, you said cats are non native species all over the world. Yep. So how did they become, how did they become? They didn't come obviously from another planet. How, yeah. how did they? There, is, um, there are two cat species in the Middle East and in Europe. They're called wild cats. And they are the progenitor, if you will, of our domesticated cats. The domestication took place in the Middle East. Um, many people suggest it's in Egypt. But once they became domesticated, like all of our domesticated animals, they started to diverge rather rapidly from their wild ancestor. But the, the size of the cat that we typically have as a pet, uh, that all of those cats originated yep. from that yep. those, those In cats. the same way that all of our dogs came from, from wolves. Right. It's pretty remarkable what can happen in a short period of time. Yeah. I wonder if anyone's looked at the cat uh, virus 
uh, that, that people who have that have more car accidents, and France has uh, a higher feral cat problem, and they have a, a higher incidence of that virus. Does that cause people neurologically to be right the <coughs> others, like, like you just there is, uh, you're talking about toxoplasmosis and its impacts on people, and it's actually become a pretty hot topic um, um, among epidemiologists and the medical profession because it does have a lot of previously underappreciated impacts on, on human beings. The stuff that's been coming out in the last couple of years suggesting that the children who are ex exposed uh, to toxoplasma end up having neurological damage done to them that at least some of the studies suggest is, is not dramatically different than the childhood exposure to lead. Well, I guess my question is more focused, does it contribute to the cat wars? Does the virus contribute oh. to the cat wars? <laughs> hmm, never thought of it in that particular particular context. I would hope that the, that the toxoplasma would actually um, sort of convince some people that it's not a good idea uh, to let their cats go outdoors and potentially get exposed and bring this back into their household. But yeah, but it has a negative, uh, un irrational effect because more Oh, I see what you mean. Ah, uh, okay, now I get it. Become irrational, so, that, so I would think that they, if they have that, they're going to be more prone to write letters like that. <laughs> if you want to get some letters like that, do an opinion piece stating that, and you'll, and you'll see what you get in response. <laughs> so as a, a person with some CRP property, what is the range of, okay, a barn cat, and I, I grew up on a farm with yeah. barn cats, uh, a farm and the CRP, what, what's the range of a, a cat in hunting? Is it a half mile, quarter mile, two mile? Yeah. Yeah, the cats, you had mentioned about the CRP land kind of working against ourselves, right? If it's in yeah. the city of the barn. So what is the approximate range of that? Well, we followed these cats around, of course. So we know not only the extent of their range, but we know the types of habitat that they prefer. They don't like to go into woods, for example. They like to hunt along edges and out in, in fields. Um, male cats have larger home ranges than females. Females tend to stay closer to home. A female cat might have a hunting range of perhaps 20 to 30 acres. A male cat, if you looked at it throughout the year, including when they range looking for mates, they could cover well over a square mile of area. So your barn cat is almost certainly a cat that visits the neighbor barn. Yeah, yeah, it's mild. Uh, I grew up out in South Dakota where we have, still have a lot of cases where the farmers ranchers have what we call the city people who deposit their pets when they don't want them anymore because maybe there either isn't a humane society because the towns are very small and they don't have the infrastructure that say Dane County has. Well, it's not uncommon to get 20 to 50 cats deposited on your doorstep yep. every summer. Every summer. That doesn't count the litter that come out of that. What do you have as a suggestion to farmers and ranchers who have that situation? Because the same is true in Wisconsin, by the way. And um, we had individual farms that had, um, I think the, the record was 78 cats. Uh, it essentially became a feral cat colony, um, even though they weren't receiving food and veterinary care. Um, but in our survey of 1,200 rural residents in Wisconsin, we specifically asked if you have cats on your property, especially in your barn, um, why don't you deal with them? Why do you tolerate them there? And the most common answer was, we simply can't get rid of them. We try to get rid of them, and you know, next year, especially the end of spring, when students are going home, suddenly, you know, the apartment cat gets deposited or you know the litters arrive. The other issue, of course, is that there's natural control taking place to some extent because we could pretty clearly show that when a barn, for example, or a farmstead, when it started to get up close to a couple of dozen cats, it was primed for an epidemic that would basically decimate the population. 
So these, they would crash, essentially, because of all those feline diseases that if you don't vaccinate cats, they, they get from one of these wandering cats. And you've been patiently raising your hand. Yeah. <laughs> I was wondering if the rate of control of free-ranging dogs mm -hmm. was a release on the population of free-ranging cats. Hmm, there's an interesting question. Um, I usually don't get that question. The one that I get is coyotes, whether coyotes are actually a control on cats. And it turns out um, that in some situations, native larger predators like coyotes actually do kill a significant number of, of cats, especially when they wander far away from human, human dwellings. Unfortunately, as I said, cats here in the Midwest are centered very much on farms. When you go further south where you have truly feral cats that are wandering widely across the landscape, they fall victim to larger predators. Dogs, you know, when, when we dealt with the dog issue in the early 20th century, what really seemed to turn it, the public's opinion about it, was rabies. And it was the, you know, dealing with the transmission of rabies. For some people, it was the fact that feral packs of dogs were running deer in the early 20th century when white-tailed deer populations were very scarce, um, that people got alarmed. And suddenly, there was just a nationwide sort of paradigm shift that now you can't let dogs roam freely. And the leash law essentially came in, and, and the legal requirement for vaccination and, and confining your dogs. And I might say, the unprotected status that if there are free-ranging dogs on your property, you can deal with them without having. And we did in Virginia. Of course, when, yeah, when people I did. On a horse farm. Yeah. If there was a free-ranging dog on that farm, the gun on the top of the fridge came out. Yeah. Because our horses were too valuable. Yeah. Yeah, and as I said, we don't have a free-ranging dog or feral dog population today. Go to some other countries, and there definitely is. You don't have to go far south of the border uh, to see it. Yeah. This isn't a scientific study the way you do scientific studies, but I'm sure if I went and talked to a lot of the people I grew up around, relatives and neighbors, we always saw an increased amount of coyotes coming onto farm properties that had large numbers of feral cats. And then if, when they wiped out a bunch of the cats, then the coyotes didn't show up at night very <coughs> much. And then once that the cat population went up, that just they just kind of followed the uh, Population. Probably, probably extent. true. Yeah. As I said, in the southern, there have been a couple of really good studies in the southern states where you can have really feral cat populations. The one that was really pretty remarkable was in the Saguaro National Park in Arizona, which is now completely surrounded by suburbia. Mm -hmm. And all of those suburban homes, of course, have free ranging cats. And the study that was done there was looking at their principal prey out in that desert habitat, which was lizards and, and, and reptiles. And they found that cats suppress, or virtually eliminated the small reptile population for several hundred meters away from the boundary of the park. But when they got farther into the park, the populations were okay. And the explanation they deduced was simply that a cat that wandered far from the safety of the backyard got exposed to, to coyote predation. So the coyote was essentially providing the buffer zone from suburbia. We're seeing a large population, or a larger population of uh, cougars, mountain lions, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. uh, like in the Dakotas now that didn't have before. Did they, did they prey on the feral cats? Well, they certainly would if they had access to them, even if a little bobcat can, can do it. Sure, a puma could. Being a larger, there's sort of an ecological rule that if you're a predator, you're going to kill the largest prey population that you can easily handle, um, which means that a puma killing a free-ranging cat presumably doesn't have too many other choices. And that presumably is part of the problem for the Florida panther in many of the areas, that's what's most abundant. We've been hoping that we would get some reports that the, the other, one of the other many invasive species in Florida might be doing a number of the Burmese pythons in the Everglades. Uh, and surprisingly, the, the studies that have been done on their diet 
don't show a lot of free-ranging cats or feral cats showing up. Very proud of myself this spring, along with some other retired wildlife biologists, we went out and there's one less Burmese python during the <laughs> python <laughs> challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I remember reading a scientist not so long ago postulating that the native cat population was actually growing, going to grow more feral because so many people are neutering their well domesticated house cats and it's the feral cats that are reproducing um, in large numbers, whereas so many, whereas the, the, the population that's well domesticated and, and living in homes is largely is being neutered mm -hmm. by the cat breeders and, and by the pet owners. And I wonder. I think that's probably true in places where you have large feral populations. So if you went to California or, or Hawaii, where there are not only lots of pet cats that are Presumably, you know, most people take care of their cats. Uh, but there are also very large feral populations out there. And there's no question that those feral populations are breeding flat out, whereas you have to imagine that a large percentage of the pet owners are responsible pet owners and do neuter them. And of course, a cat that's born in the wild, you know, tends to remain an unadoptable wild cat. And that is part of the problem with the trapping of cats, if you bring them into a shelter, if they were a feral cat or a cat that was you know, living largely independent of people, they simply are not very attractive to adopt as a pet, which is why large numbers of them get, get euthanized. The, another thing, you, know, you talked about the, the dog control. Um, in the early part of the, of the 19th century, um, Pigs roam free in the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in yeah. fact, yeah. were very significant. They, they roam free. Well, what happened was people didn't have garbage disposals. You took your trash, you threw it out the window, and the neighborhood pigs ate that garbage and ran up and down the streets and deposited their waste everywhere. And there were actually significant cases in property law dealing with government trying to control pigs. And, and of course, pig owners wanted the right to have their pigs run at large in town. Sure. Yeah, no, I said it. it's not unique. I mean, we've got problems with lots of animals that fall into the same category of, you know, society will tolerate them till they reach a certain number, and then we decide, you know, enough's enough, we've got to deal with it. It just seems that with cats, we're reaching such huge numbers compared for example, to the number of dogs that were causing enough problems in the early 20th century to, to warrant some control measures. Tom? So the New York Times, this article that started all this was a review of the book, and I can't remember the last name of the woman, it was Barbara? Kingsolver. Kingsolver, what's it called? Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, based on that, well, the reason I sent you the emails, because she made it sound like, well, this book isn't really all that accurate. And I'm wondering what your take was on that New York Times review. There's nothing that I can see in the book that's that's not accurate. So you have the New York it Times. Is, it was a like very this. conspicuous attempt to to talk about the cat wars. I mean, to sort yeah. of enca encapsulate both sides of the debate, if if you will, and do fair justice to both. Although Peter Mara is a is a biologist, and you know, in the end, he reaches conclusions very similar to the ones that I just shared with you. But that review was still questioning the idea of whether it was billions, millions, or thousands of birds killed, and that, that's what. Yeah, I love Barbara Kinsolver's, you know, writing, but you know, she's she presumably has not delved into you know how the analysis was done and the fact that they're it's really based on a lot of studies from around the country. And the methods are all pretty <coughs> clearly spelled out uh, so that anyone can look and see how they arrived at those numbers. But let's just imagine that they're off by an order of magnitude. Yeah. That's still, you know, tens of billions of, of birds being killed. That's still pretty, pretty alarming. Imagine that they were off even, you know, by two orders of magnitude, if a billion birds are being killed a year, that's still pretty pretty alarming from a conservation perspective. Yeah. 
I wonder if there's other cooperative arrangements like cats and raccoons in, in a symbiosis relationship that cats have other than raccoons. Um, well, I'm not sure I follow. What's the symbiosis? Well, the, 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 the study in, in Chicago of raccoons that the cats would, would uh, work with the raccoons to find food. Huh. I have not. Behaviorally, that doesn't surprise me. Animals are pretty, uh, pretty clever about finding sources of food. And um, we were amazed um, at some of the cats that we had radioed at, at how clever they were at finding human supplied food. Um, we initially thought we were going to find feral cats in Wisconsin. We didn't know. But we thought we'd find some, so I alerted all of the students in the wildlife department to sort of on their study areas be on the lookout for any cats that they thought might be truly feral. And a bunch of the students went cross-country skiing um, out at uh, Indian Lake. And they came back and they said, you know, we were out there first thing in the morning and we found cat tracks almost a mile off the road. He said, sure, that's got to be a feral cat. So we were out there the next day. Uh, sure enough, there were the tracks. We were, because it was in snow, we could track the animal to a, uh, to a hollow tree. Uh, we caught her and radioed her and monitored her daily routine, which was to leave her warm hollow tree, go down to the parking lot of Indian Lake, hide out <coughs> in the bushes there, wait for a car to come up, and as soon as the people were gone, dash up under the hood of the car and sit up on the engine block to stay warm. And when a car left, to quickly then go over to the garbage bins and see what they left. <laughs> so, I mean, the adaptability of these animals, but still, once again, being very dependent on humans, which is why I describe them as mostly human commensals. Just one comment on control and then a question. So yeah. in our case with the barn, the, one of the controls was the highway but that went right next to it and <laughs> took its share of cats. But uh, on a house cat, you know, had a house cat, and um, is there any decrease in the efficiency that they kill birds if they are declawed front end or back? Very little. We, we, we tried to come up with all kinds. We figured we had all these radioed animals. We were going to try some various devices to see what we could do to make them less efficient. Uh, bells clearly don't work. Uh, we did have some cats that were declawed. They weren't significantly deterred. They can bat the animal down. They do the actual killing with their, with their canines, with their fangs. Uh, I engaged some engineering students in one of their senior year projects and said, I wonder whether you'd be interested in working with me on an idea that we came up with that is sort of an improvement on the bell idea. Most birds have an almost universally understood alarm call. It's a call that they give when they are confronted with a predator or, or something that's alarming. And it's immediately understood by, by virtually all other birds. And it turns out the people who studied this alarm call have found that it's in a very, very narrow range of frequencies. It has a very specific set of characteristics. So my challenge to the students was, could we design a collar that would not tinkle like a bell, but that would broadcast something that birds understood as meaning that you're about to be pounced on by a predator, which would be an alarm call. And to their credit, they came up with a really clever design, broadcast a, a beautiful bird alarm call, synthesized. Uh, they even put a little switch in it so that if you had a, an outdoor cat, it would turn the collar on when it went out the door and turn it off when it came in the door. But when the cat went outside every 10 seconds, the alarm call was broadcast. It worked pretty well. I tried to sell it to National Audubon Society. I said, this is something that Audubon wants to have their logo on. And their board, knowing about cat wars, said, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Um, and it didn't win you the $25 million. We didn't. No, we didn't get it, right. Uh, somebody over in the UK did, did actually build one, and I don't know how successful the sales have been, but over in the UK they did come up 
with something that's pretty effective. It's a bib, essentially, that goes around the cat and it hangs down so that it interferes with their ability to get their front legs out and pounce on something, um, which looked cheap and probably somewhat effective. Um, I'm wondering about the toxoplasmosis rabies parallel, rabies yeah. dogs, toxoplasmosis cats. Any movement by mothers? Uh, I don't know how prevalent the toxoplasmosis is. But <coughs> well, as I said, the, pers the, the, the prevalence in North American humans is pretty high, which means we've all Presumably, about a third of us have been exposed at some point. I know I have, well, for obvious that. reasons. But the question is, is you would think, because every pregnant woman in the U.S. is warned about this in their prenatal visits, you would think it would be alarming enough uh, when they describe to them, you know, the problem of fetal development that can happen. Um, that it would be just as alarming as rabies, but apparently that hasn't been no hasn't been taken. Of the effects on children, the lead -like effects. Oh yeah, oh, as I said, that's been a really hot topic now of looking at the neurological problems. Mm -hmm. I have another question too. Mm -hmm. it seems as though the parallel for people is the is the rapid increasing people population and the fear of discussing death and let alone and euthanasia. <laughs> uh, they, they seem to run in parallel, this cat, uh, these cat wars and the, I guess, the controversy about the invasion of the cat. Yeah, I've always thought that a lot of the, the cat people, as I described them, you know, they're very anthropomorphic in that they're projecting sort of human-like. Right. That's the bottom of the cats. Yeah. Guess, yeah. So it's not surprising that there would be some parallels to the issues of human rights and the issues of animal rights, right. that those would, would get intertwined. That has gone anywhere, though, I guess. No. Tom? Just before we go, I'd like to point out um, the final, one of the final scenes from Old Yeller. <laughs> uh, and one of the pivotal scenes in To Kill a Mockingbird. Both involved shooting either your favorite dog yeah. or a wild dog and showing how tough and what a good shot addicts is. Yeah. I'm trying to think if there's any equivalent of that for shooting cats. <laughs> in, in great literature? Probably not. <laughs> and that, um, you know, this just goes along with what you're talking about with the, uh, the whole thing with why dogs are different. Pretty powerful images from American movies. Well, and you would guess from at least popular cultural norms that there are dog people and there are cat people, and that yeah. these are very different populations. The cats have never been viewed. You know, you, there's no image of the raving mad dog. Excuse me, the maybe raving mad cat sitting there trembling in the streets um, that somebody has to get. And, and cats don't have the same. Uh, bad side to them the dogs do in that way. And I think that's part of what you guys are saying yeah. about cats are nice and more and more true. Well, let's just hope somebody gets very rich and claims the Nicholson. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Yeah.